Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Late Night Learning. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Plomba. Now today we're gonna to be going through media management. This is an area of research that has really blossomed over the last 50 years or so as of this recording and has really, really taken shape probably in the last 30 years or so. Media management looks at a number of issues. It looks at economics, management, entrepreneurship, uh, market competition, uh, audience analysis, and all other facets related to these topics within media and entertainment industries. And so when we think about media management, we think about how media firms compete, kind of how they regulate themselves, what the organizational structure might be, how they converse with audience members, and perhaps how audience members consume their own content. So let's get started. So what is the worth of media industries? If we really think about why are you listening to this lecture? Why are we even bothering with looking at this? Well, this is some evidence that can help reinforce your decision to take this journey with me. So for the television and SVOD services, it's worth collectively about 119 billion in 2022. It'll be up from 64 billion in 2017, so that's an estimation. Advertising online video worth about 37 billion. Uh, radio, 21 billion in the United States in 2015. Film, 2018. North American box office was 12 billion. Global, 42 billion. Video games, global, 138 billion. By 2021, it is estimated that mobile gaming will comprise 60% of total video game revenue. And so it's important here just to kind of remember that these media industries are exceptionally large. They accrue exceptional resources and revenue. And so while I'll never ask you these numbers directly, you should have a sense of how much television is worth, about 100 billion, the film box office, about 40 billion, the video game industry globally, about 138 billion, domestically, I believe it's about 50 or 60 million, billion, excuse me. And so it's important to have this in the back of your mind as you're studying these particular industries. Let's go to the next slide. So theory of the firm. If we're thinking about how these firms make money, how these firms decide to launch new products and decide to create new kinds of content in order to gain revenue, we have to remember the theory of the firm. Basically, it's to maximize profits. That is the number one focus of any media corporation. It's to maximize profits. CEO pay now is mostly tied to the shareholder price of stocks. This practice really began in the 1980s. Before then, there were other metrics that were used to determine CEO pay. But in the 1980s, it became popular to tie stock prices to CEO pay. And so this practice has also been introduced in media and entertainment industries. Firms are meant to work to improve industry performance and behavior. That's ultimately the goal. How can we become more efficient as a company? How can we accrue greater revenue as a company? How can we find other audiences that perhaps are underserved? These are questions that are constantly being asked in order to gain greater market share and even great gain greater wallet share. Wallet share being how much are people willing to pay for your product? For instance, in an annual year, it may be that consumers spend $10 on McDonald's, but only $5 on Burger King, let's say. So that kind of looks at share of wallet there as an example. And so it's important to really think about how these firms are erected and structured so that they can compete against each other. Let's go to the next slide. So structure conduct performance is a kind of model to better understand how media organizations function, regulate themselves, and then compete in the market. So this is the basis of industrial organization framework, and a firm is based around structure, conduct, and performance. The structure is the market concentration, it looks at product differentiation, and it looks at barriers to entry. So you may say to yourself, well, if we're looking at Nintendo here, Nintendo has a sizable market concentration right now. Uh, product differentiation is very, very strong with Nintendo compared to Sony and Microsoft. Nintendo offers video game consoles, 
geared toward casual gamers and geared toward non-traditional gamers. So Nintendo thrives with its own line of products that are really heavily differentiated from its competitors, and the barriers to entry are high. You need a lot of capital to enter in the video game console marketplace, and even just the video game marketplace itself. The second phase of this is conduct. So conduct deals with pricing behavior. How do firms price their own products? Product strategy. This is especially important in media and entertainment because seasonally products are launched and it's based around what's going on in the season. And so for television, we know that new episodes for primetime television typically launch in the fall. We know that blockbuster movies that typically involve action and adventure debut from about May to about uh, August, let's say. And so it's important to really think about how these films are launching their own products and also thinking about who else is launching products against you. Advertising strategy. Advertising strategy may mean placing online advertisements or YouTube advertisements or conducting some sort of content branding or or native advertising as well. Different ways in which that we can engage our audiences. Investment strategy. What kinds of resources do we need? Do we need new video game software to develop a new video game? Do we need different kinds of cameras in order to film the latest avatar installation? And then there's research and development. What do we need uh, in order to learn about our audiences, to test products, and to develop new products and other uh, phases of our organization. The third piece to this is performance. Allocative efficiency. Are we allocating resources efficiently? Are we giving them to finance, to advertising, to research and development, to production, right? If we think about a media and entertainment industry uh, firm, are they being given these resources effectively? Product efficiency. Is our product being made efficiently? Are we conducting enough research to know that it's popular in the market still? Do we know how much people are willing to pay for our product uh, annually? What is, their, uh, what is our wallet share, if you will? Uh, technological progress. Are we still evolving? Are we still exploring different lenses to use on the cameras that record our sitcoms in our studio in order to make sure that we're kind of on the uh, cutting edge of quality and, and, and how we might present uh, a new episode of, of Big Bang Theory or something else. Uh, equity or fairness cultural. So that's another phase of this in which we think about the culture that goes on in our particular firm. How is the performance of our people? And how does our culture reflect that, uh, the level of performance that we achieve? So the performance really should inform how the structure of the market is. So performance, if you look at that, really should inform the structure. So it's kind of circular in a way. You go from structure to conduct to performance and then back up to structure. Because our performance in the marketplace will determine ultimately the structure of the marketplace itself. Let's move on. Okay, this is another kind of model to look at media and entertainment industries. And so Porter's Five Forces is really, really useful because it helps us kind of deconstruct the marketplace and see what's going on. Now I recognize there's a lot on this slide. I'm going to hold your hand through all of this. And so let's start with the first sphere in the middle, industry rivalry. So industry rivalry looks at rivals in an industry. It looks at the number of competitors, it looks at quality differences. What's the quality of a CBS show versus an NBC show versus a Netflix show? Other differences, switching costs. Switching costs are a very, very big deal. This is something that all of you really should pay attention to, especially with the streaming wars that will be coming as of this broadcast. Switching costs looks at how much it takes for a consumer to switch from one product to another product. Now we know with cable and satellite, it takes perhaps a few days, a few weeks for you to change from Direct TV to Time Warner. You have to make a phone call. You have to return your cable box. There are all of these costs, both, both financial 
and time-wise that really constrict and constrain this entire process. But we know that any of you can pull out your credit card right now and cancel or sign up for Netflix. It takes all of two seconds. And so SVOD services are very, very different in this in that the switching costs are remarkably low compared to their television brethren. And then customer loyalty is also impactful uh, here when we look at industry rivals. Uh, HBO has been under the lens recently since the ending of Game of Thrones because there have been people who have uh, canceled their HBO subscriptions. So it's kind of an interesting media management case study. How does HBO keep going? Now obviously HBO p picks high quality content, content that you don't normally see elsewhere, but based around that strategy, they need to think of different ways to pull in customers. Additionally, Time Warner, HBO's parent, has mandated that HBO pick up more content. And so this is kind of interesting because here in industry rivalry, we talked about quality differences. Will the quality of HBO be watered down if it picks up more content? There's an argument to be made for that. Let's go to another sphere that looks at a marketplace. Buyer power. So buyer power is to the right of the screen. We consider the number of customers and the size of each order. Size of each order is not really um, uh, a, a major uh, consideration in media and entertainment. If you buy a movie ticket, the size of each order is the movie itself, right? It doesn't really differentiate among people. Uh, if somebody is going to stream Stranger Things season four, uh, there's not really going to be much of a difference between myself streaming and you streaming. So media and entertainment industries are interesting in that the product itself is packaged similarly, right? If we went to a McDonald's and we wanted a particular sandwich, we can customize that to any way that we want, whereas in media and entertainment, we can toggle with platforms, but the content itself is pretty much fixed, right? There really isn't any kind of customization, at least not now, with watching Stranger Things 4, uh, unless you kind of do a choose your own story and then you might be able to make an argument that the size of each order might vary, right? Differences between competitors. Simply put, uh, the buyer may evaluate the differences between competitors from his or her own standpoint. Now, Netflix and Hulu are repositories for tons of content. I think Netflix has something along the lines of 500 TV shows and 2,000 movies. Uh, Hulu has something similar to that. You know, it would take several lifetimes, uh, arguably, to, to go through all of this content, so consumers have to really think about what are some key differences that they can visualize and point to when they're evaluating each service? Price sensitivity. So price sensitivity looks at uh, inelastic and elastic kinds of price sensitivity. So if the price sensitivity is inelastic or if the demand is inelastic, consumers will likely tolerate price change. So in other words, it's inelastic, it's unbendable. It doesn't matter if you charge people $15 to watch Netflix or if you charge them $20 to watch Netflix per month. The fact is, is that the price sensitivity is inelastic, meaning most people won't budge. They're gonna pay the $20 to see Netflix because it means that much. And normally this has been applied to things like medication, right? We generally think of inelastic demand or, or price sensitivity being inelastic for medication Yes, you're going to pay $100 more for that insulin despite the price hike because you desperately need it, right? So we think of that kind of stuff as inelastic. Uh, for here, we might be thinking about subscription prices and other things uh, that consumers look at when they're purchasing um, entertainment and media to consume. Ability to substitute. Can you substitute out one product for another? That's arguable. You don't really see other forms of Stranger Things elsewhere. You don't really see other forms of The Path or Game of Thrones or uh, Pretty Little Liars or Barry or all of these other shows across HBO and Hulu and Netflix that are really unique, right? That really stand out and really try to carve niches. And they do this because they don't want people to perceive them as substitutable. So for a lot of this 
the kind of content I've mentioned, particularly among SVOD services, it's essential because one, you're fighting over niche audiences to begin with and you want to give these audiences reason to keep subscribing to you. And there's also the cost of changing there for the buyer, him or herself. Um, if we go to supplier power on the left hand side, we have the number of suppliers, size of suppliers. So when we think of suppliers, we might be thinking about who supplies content to Netflix, who supplies content to NBC. Now, when we look at this, you could say to yourself, well, don't they make stuff in-house? Yes, they absolutely do. Netflix has an in-house studio, NBC has an in-house studio, so does CBS, ABC, Fox, uh, Disney has an in-house film studio, uh, Warner Brothers has an in-house film studio and TV studio, so yes, a lot of these media conglomerates have things in-house. But we know for every in-house production company, we know that there's Blumhouse Productions that produces horror. We know that there's A24. We know that there's Monkey Paws by uh, Jordan Peele. We know Bad Robot is run by J.J. Abrams, the famed science fiction director. And so there are film studios and production companies that are outside the realm of these large parent organizations. So when we do think of number of suppliers, you need to think about big studios and small studios. Does NBC sometimes produce content for ABC? The answer is actually yes. ABC may use an NBC studio to create and produce a TV show that will air on ABC. And yes, NBC is paid to rent out its studio. That practice has happened for quite some time, even though it's kind of stopping right now. A lot of studios are becoming a little bit more internal and insulated when they're producing content. There is also the uniqueness of service as well. How unique is it to have Blumhouse? Well, if you believe in the executive producer, uh, I believe his name is Jason or Josh Blumhouse, then it's huge because he's a horror producer. He knows what he's doing. Can you really substitute him? Can you substitute out that expertise? I wouldn't want to have that conversation. The same thing might be with Steven Spielberg. Can you find anybody else to create a coming of age story as well as Steven Spielberg? Maybe not. So when you think about supplier power, think about what is being supplied here and, and what in this facet is TV content and film content. You also want to think about your ability to substitute and cost of changing. Um, if I negate this contract with Blumhouse or A24 and I say to myself, well, we can find a better production company, I can do something different, I can do something better, well, that's going to delay your movie. You might have holding contracts with these actors and actresses and a holding contract states that they are under your uh, control, so to speak, for six months or so, right? I might give a holding contract to Will Smith to say, listen, from May of 2020 to August of 2020, I'm paying you, don't take on any work, we are going to film Men in Black 5. So we sign that contract now in August of 2019, Will Smith, don't take any work from May 2020 to August 2020. I need to hold you as I'm putting together Men in Black 5. If that doesn't go through, if there's a cost in changing, it's that. Because I might say, you know, Will, we couldn't get the money from Sony to co-finance this movie. He still gets paid. That's important to note with holding contracts. If a movie falters during production or if it, or if it you know, starts production but then uh, doesn't go all the way through, many times the creatives that are involved still get compensation. And then you really have to think about, well, do I need to go to another production studio? Or do I just not produce this? Do I just leave Men in Black 5 alone and you know I don't really pursue it? Those are some considerations to have when we're talking about ability to substitute and cost of changing. All of that is really, really huge. Below, we have threat of substitution, substitute performance, cost of change. Is there a substitute for Netflix, HBO, or Hulu, right? If we look at the SVOD market here, if Porter's Five Forces is applied to the SVOD market, there might be. You could argue broadcast television is a substitute. You could argue video games may be a substitute as well. Um, and those are considerations to make. And a lot of these media firms are taking note of that. 
In fact, one of them, Netflix has said that Fortnite, the video game Fortnite, is one of its biggest competitors. Finally, up top, we have threat of new entry. Now, I pick SVOD because we know the streaming wars are about to happen as of this broadcast. We know NBC is launching an SVOD platform. We know Disney Plus is coming out. We know Disney Plus, in fact, might be looped together with Hulu and ESPN because Disney now has a majority stake in Hulu as per the Fox absorption that has gone on in the last year. It now has a majority stake in Hulu, and I believe in five years it will uh, own Hulu in entirely. Uh, the other portion of Hulu is owned by NBC Comcast or Comcast NBC. And so when we think of threat of new entry in the SVOD market, oh my goodness, Disney Plus, NBC, and Time Warner are all coming out with SVOD services. That's insane. That's crazy. Uh, it will th kind of upset the market as we know it now. Time and cost of entry uh, will be immediate. These companies have multiple uh, sources. They have large, large uh, revenue holdings. And so they are poised to be able to enter in the market really without a hitch. Specialist knowledge. They have entertainment executives that have worked at Netflix. They have entertainment executives that have worked at Hulu. Uh, and so they, they are well positioned to at least make the entry into this marketplace. Economies of scale is a really big one I want all of you to pay attention to. Economies of scale really references how big can you scale this operation. Now, a Disney platform makes total sense because Disney has every cartoon and movie that many of us have grown up with. The sheer volume and potential for exploitation is tremendous with Disney. On top of that, Disney now has holdings such as X-Men and The Simpsons from its absorption, its Fox absorption, and it also has content from ABC as well as ESPN. I mean, if there was ever a, a media conglomerate that was a juggernaut, it's Disney. And, and I look forward myself to even seeing the Disney platform itself. Cost advantages, huge cost advantages in the SVOD service. You don't have to pay a, a satellite uh, company or you know, cut them in on profits or you know, negotiate with advertisers or anything. The SVOD uh, marketplace is really interesting in that it does allow companies to circumvent advertising. Now, Hulu does offer content with commercials and without commercials, but in the SVOD ecosystem, it's not necessary. And in fact, many SVOD services have really turned to product placement and other items to help um, shore up advertising revenue. I think the latest season of Stranger Things had something like 100 product placements or something, something large like that. And so Netflix doesn't show commercials. It makes sense for them to enter into this fray of using product placements like you know Coca-Cola and Eggo Waffles. Uh, technology protection. Many of these SVOD services are encrypted well. I haven't necessarily heard of any hacking that has gone on that is systemic or has created some sort of issue for these particular firms. Also, SVOD prices are fair, right? Arguably, what you're getting on Netflix, not that you'll ever have the time or uh, the, the ability to consume everything, is well priced. You know, you get all of this stuff for $12 a month. You get all of this stuff for $7 a month. You get all of this stuff for $15 a month. So I do think part of the way or part of the reason why these SVOD services haven't necessarily been hacked is because most people think the prices are fair and many people share accounts. So account sharing is almost uh, it is a very, very bright thing to do on the part of these SVOD services as I do think part of the reason why they employ it is to insulate themselves from systematic hacking. And then barriers to entry. Uh, barriers to entry in the SVOD marketplace is huge and very, very high. Um, it is absolutely dependent upon uh, the economies of scale that the firm has and its ability to really stream the content well. 
and Netflix, Hulu, HBO, and I imagine Disney, Time Warner, and uh, NBC will also prove themselves to be adept at that. Let's go on to the next slide. Perfect competition. So I've shared with you a few models here in really looking at how these firms are um, organized. But it's important to also note how these marketplaces function rather than simply looking at the, the marketplace through several models. Perfect competition is one form of a marketplace. And this is kind of an economics concept that is very, very basic and that has been applied to a number of firms to really help us understand how these firms are construed. So for one, perfect competition denotes that there are similar products, homogenous products. You could make an argument that radio and newspaper could kind of fit in here, although I don't know that I would necessarily put them here. Um, but there is a lot of sports talk radio that's very, very similar. There are a lot of newspapers that cover the same kinds of content. You could argue that those mediums are closer than others to perfect competition. There are also many firms in competition. There are, are low to no barriers to entry in the firm itself. No firm dominates the market. And like I said, it really is difficult to find this. You might find perfect competition in produce marketplaces like fruits and vegetables, right? There might be five companies that produce bananas. And so the product itself, a banana, is very, very similar to other bananas. And so it makes sense that it would be kind of a perfect market competition uh, for, the, for the banana industry itself. Let's go on to the next slide. There is also monopolistic competition. Monopolistic, monopolistic competition is a bit more similar to what we see with books, magazines, and radio, and even newspapers. There are differentiated products, and as we can see here on the magazine stand, there are many, many different kinds of magazines that are available to people. There are many firms. There are no to low barriers of entry, and this includes, like I said earlier, books, magazines, and radio. And so when we really think about the media and entertainment industries, we can quickly see that there are numerous, numerous ways in which to look at them. It's incumbent upon all of us, I think, to really consider how these media and entertainment industries function. It's important to really, really consider that these media and entertainment industries are constantly in a state of movement. And I think that's the one thing I want to end this lecture on, is movement. These firms are constantly trying to prognosticate and figure out what the future is going to hold. I don't think a decade ago, NBC would have been thinking about putting together an app to compete with Netflix. I don't think 20 years ago, Blockbuster was worried about Netflix. In fact, Blockbuster was quoted as saying Netflix is kind of a fad. And even when Netflix came to Blockbuster to sell, I believe it was about 51% of its own company to Blockbuster, Blockbuster said no. And so media firms and entertainment firms that have survived the last 20 years have seen a bit of a technological revolution and are very, very wary about making those same mistakes. So these media and entertainment industries, uh, and especially the firms involved in, with them, are constantly in a state of movement. Well, that's all the time we have on Late Night Learning. As always, keep laughing and keep learning.